Hi. Uh, at first, I wanted to talk to you about how to teach uh, kids how to code and in general why we should. But uh, actually, when I started pre uh, preparing this presentation, I realized that I want to talk about much more about digital education, why it matters, uh, how you matter in this process, and why it's so important for me personally. And I want to start with a short story about my journey that brought me here. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at this point in my life when I had no idea what to do. And nowadays, people, when they get to that point, they usually start to learn how to code. But that wasn't my choice. My choice was to start to learn Chinese. And uh, I come from Vietnam, and Chinese and Vietnamese are completely different languages. So I was very frustrated. It's very difficult. And I met my friend who told me, like, why don't you learn how to code? Is it OK? How, why don't you learn how to code? Because programming is actually another language, so maybe you should try. And I discovered that coding is so much easier than Chinese. <laughs> it's so much easier. So I decided that maybe this is a path I could follow. But before I actually did that, I also had a previous experience of trying to join some industry, but realizing that people in that industry are not really my kind of people. So first, I joined for one month. I went to every possible conference, meetup. I volunteered, and, and I met you guys and girls to see if you're actually people I want to work with. And to my relief, I realized that you are regular humans. You actually have your passions. You have your hobbies. It takes some time to understand your jokes, but when you do, they're actually funny. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the fact that during that month, I met so many people who were so open and eager to share their knowledge. I'm just a little bit afraid I will fall down at some point. But So I met so many people so, uh, who were so eager to share their knowledge, to talk to people like me who had no idea about technology. Mm, and it really also mattered that there are people like the previous speaker, speaker who talked about diversity, about inclusion, about privilege. That really mattered for me. So I decided that I'm going to combine my previous experience in education and in social creative projects with my newfound passion for technology. So I met Karolina Cikowska, who founded Girls Code Fund Foundation. It's a nonprofit that supports girls and women in gaining basic tech skills. After a year, we founded um, a company called Kids Code Fun, and we started teaching kids how to code. Uh, we taught kids and girls age 8 to 15. And just last year, I became the head of program at Central Technology Hub in Warsaw, Central Dom Technology, and now I'm the general director of that institution. So the questions I want to answer today is I want to tell you a bit more about the current state of digital education. I want to actually consider if coding is actually a future skill. I want to tell you how you can participate and how can you help in providing digital skills education. And I'm going to introduce a special guest at the, at the very end. And so, the, so you really need to stay till the end because she came here from Warsaw and it's a special event for her, to, for her too. Let's start with the current state of digital skills education. So we all agree that technology it will keep changing the way we live, the way we work. And usually when we talk about skills and training and education, we are preparing, we, we, what we have in mind is preparing people to join future workforce. And we already know from all different kinds of reports and predictions that probably around 70% of, of jobs will change the, in the way we are doing those jobs because of technology. Some of the jobs will be um, automated and replaced, but some will still keep going. And we know that around half of European workers need to reskill and learn no sk new skills usually connected to technology. So in 2015, European Commission predicted that we will need about 800,000 skilled ICT workers. And by this year, by 2020, now it's 2020, and just last year, they introduced a program, Digital Europe program, that will introduce around 256 thousand people. I'm doing the math. Now, I'm not sure it's enough, uh, but I'm more interested in actually what happens in schools, in European schools, because future workforce is one thing, but in order to actually let people, uh, enable people to join workers, you have to focus on their education at schools. So there was a, journey, a survey of schools, 
ICT in education in 2013, and there were some very disturbing results of that survey. For example, I learned that between three and seven students in Europe shared one computer. Another stat is that 20% of students actually never, almost never use a computer in, during the class. So I was hoping when they published new reports last year that something changed. And of course, there were more computers. But I also learned that less than one out of five students actually went to school where they had access to high-speed internet. And I also learned that 70% of students in secondary schools never actually experienced coding at schools. So if you ever wonder why we don't have enough IT people, programmers, developers in Europe, that might be a reason. But I actually ask myself, is actually coding the skills that we need to teach? Do we really need to teach 100% of students how to code? I looked into some predictions, reports from different think tanks and um, big corporations about what kind of skills we will need in the future. And of course, we need more than tech skills. Actually, we, we actually, when you look at the list of future skills, the tech skills are very far behind some soft skills, like general problem solving, communicating, managing people, understanding people, being oriented to create services that are used by people. And there were a lot of skills connected with learning. Those lists are very long, very long so I tried to somehow group all those skills and I created just a very short summary, which says that in general, for the future, to survive the future, what we need is we need to learn how to learn all our lives, lifelong learning. We need to know how to solve complex problems. And we need to learn how to work with people and also with people in mind. Basically, to put it in just one sentence, we need to constantly and intentionally think feel, and change. Doesn't sound so difficult, right, for humans to constantly think, feel, and change, but this, is, this means intentionally. And we need that not only to be successful in the workforce, we actually need it also to survive in the world that, according to all the predictions, it's going to be very uncertain, very ambiguous, very complex, and always changing. So those skills are not only skills that we need to be successful employees, but actually to adapt to the future that it will be constantly changing. And if you add tech skills to those soft skills and social skills, what you get is basically we need to learn how to effectively communicate with people and machines to solve complex problems. This is what we need. So when you'll be investing in education and also tech education, coding education, please remember that it should be always followed with soft skills, social skills, and cognitive development. The, the challenges we face when it comes to digital education, you already saw the stats. So you know that we're missing computers, we're missing internet co connections, some very basic things. So we lack resources. But even if we do have resources, and I've seen a lot of beautiful workshop rooms where we had newest devices and great internet access, but there was no one to teach the class. So another challenge that we have is lack of teachers and role models. And this is so important because, for example, just last year, one of my friends who also runs educational projects, she actually created a project in which, in which teachers could get money for the devices and could get training for top universities in Poland. And she couldn't find a thousand teachers to join because teachers are, are underpaid, overworked, frustrated, and it's just not worth it. This is, this is what is really disturbing. And according to some research by Professor Jacek Pyzalski, also from Poland, when we talk to students, teenagers, who are very active in a digital world, creating some very good projects, creative projects for good causes, when you talk to them, they say that the people who actually inspired them to do good and use technology for good were mostly teachers. So we need role models in our schools and outside the school system. Another challenge is lack of growth mindset. And growth mindset is a mindset 
in which you think that you can do better than you're doing now. And it's very disturbing to realize that 60% of Polish students don't believe that they can actually get smarter than, than they are now. Imagine you're 12 year old and, you're, and you tell yourself like, this is my prime time. I don't get to be smarter than this. It's quite scary and it's not only Poland. There are many countries where 50% of students don't have that, that belief that they could do better than, than they are doing right now. So what we do, what we try to do with our projects uh, at Girls Code Fund, Kids Code Fund, and also the Central Technology Hub. So thinking about the growth mindset, one of the things that lets you feel comfortable with your failures and comfortable with the fact that maybe you're not so smart now, but you can get better, is basically creating an environment where students will feel safe, accepted, and that they will feel that their failures don't matter right now because they will just sum up to the future successes and future lessons that they will learn. And I always say in my bio that, bio that one of the favorite things I, I like to do is to explain to people what is programming by using a plush chicken. This is actually, this is a chicken, this is a turkey head. So I have this turkey head. I don't have it with me now because it's been so, used so many times by kids that it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really work uh, now. And I'm not going to run this uh, game with you because you're all programmers and it will be very easy to, for you. And you probably saw different variations of this game somewhere else because it, at some point it, it, become, it became viral in different forms. So basically, Imagine that I have a very funny hat. It can be a chicken hat. And I ask one of the volunteers, the kids, to hold it. And I move away, and I ask the group to tell me what to do to put that chicken hat on my head. At first, they're very shy to tell me what to do, but then they realize this is actually a situation when they can tell the teacher what to do, and they're using that. So usually the first thing that they tell me is to just walk straight. So if they tell me to walk straight, I keep going and I don't stop even when I reach the student who holds the, uh, the hat. So they realize that their instructions need to be more specific. So they tell me to, for example, make five steps, turn around, but turn around 15 degrees, and so on. And after this, when they finally put the hat on my head, we start talking. I ask them, what is the most popular language in the world? And, some, and usually they say English, Chinese, some of them say Polish. And I ask them if they know if there are more mobile phones or people on this planet. And they start, start counting how many mobile phones they have at home and the par their parents have at home. And believe me, every year there are more at home. Like even five mobile phones at, in one house. And they realize that there are more mobile phones than people on this planet, and I asked them, okay, so what language do you use to talk to mobile phones, computers, machines, laptops? And some of them already know that the, we use programming languages, and they realize that programming languages are actually the most popular languages on the planet, but we don't use them to talk to people. We use those languages to talk to machines. So if you learn them, you can learn how to talk to machines. And what they did during the exercise with the chicken is they basically tried to talk like they would talk to the machine. We talk about how precise the instructions had to be. We talk about the fact that uh, there wasn't just one person giving me instructions, but the whole group was participating. And this is how very often programmers work. They actually work together. Uh, and they, we talk about how they heard one person say something and realized that instruction wasn't specific enough, so they made a more specific instruction, so how they learned from each other. And we also talk about how they could, of course, just tell me to go straight and put the hat on my head, but they, they could also tell me to dance around the room and then put the hat on my head, which would make me much more like in risk of breaking my bones. It might be more fun, but it would still work. So we talk about how there are different kinds of solutions to actually reach one goal. And some of them might be more efficient, some of them not, but in general, the result might be the same. So there is no one correct answer when we, 
when we create some solutions, especially tech solutions. And then we start using very creative tools to learn coding, and I will show you those, those tools later on. I just need to have a drink. I'm so scared of talking in front of people. What I really like about this game is that it's cre it creates this atmosphere that you can have fun. You can make, make mistakes, and the teacher is not someone who knows everything, but who can participate in games. So this is how we also gain trust. This is how we make them feel involved in the process, because from the very beginning, they actually get to participate, even without knowing anything about coding. And in our Girls Code Fund and Kids Code Fund classes and all the educational projects I'm trying to run, what we do to create this atmosphere and to create this environment where, where you can grow, first of all, we build a connection. So if you know someone who wants to learn coding and if you want to teach some kids coding, these are the things we are trying to do. We build a connection, which means that we're actually learning something about the people, the kids we are trying to teach. We learn about their hobbies. One of the first presentations they make is about their hobbies, dislikes, and, uh, and their favorite pets and friends. We make them feel safe, which means, for example, that we always talk to them um, on their level, so we never stand above them. We just try to sit next to them or just be on the same level. But it also means that we don't judge them in front of others. And we don't generally try not to judge them in general, and by judging, I don't mean only judging their skills and the results of their work, but also judging the way they behave and the way they express their feelings. One of the difficult lessons is that for teachers is that kids don't have the, the skills to manage, understand, and express emotions the, the way we do. So some teachers might get very frustrated because, for example, they see students being mean, aggressive, and they think that this is because they don't like them as teachers, or maybe they don't like this class, maybe they don't like the topic. And they forget that we have no idea where this kid comes from. For example, I had a student, teenage girl, who didn't want to participate in, the, in a class, and she didn't want to do the project. She started being very mean to me and to other students. And I actually told her that, you know, it's okay if you don't want to do this. If it's okay if you don't want to participate in this, and if you want to, you can actually go home, go meet your friends, and it, it will be fine. And I was very surprised that she actually stayed. She didn't do anything, and I, and I saw that she wasn't very happy about being there, but she didn't go away. And I felt like I failed because I didn't manage to create an environment where she could freely try something new and freely make mistakes in front of me, but what I learned after that class is that that day, her mother, her mother went to her teacher and she knew that she was in trouble and she was so afraid of going home that she actually stayed in the classroom even though she didn't like it. So we have no idea what happens in kids' life outside the classroom. We, we have no idea if the fact that, that they're angry now it's because of the topic and us or and everything beside that. They can be angry because they're hungry, for example, and they don't know even that they're hungry and how to explain it to you. We let them do the stuff the way we want, and I've seen parents who are programmers who really try to explain to, the ki to kids, their kids how exactly this project should be made and what will, is the best solution, because you know what's the best solution, what's the easiest solution, but the easiest solution for you is not their solution. And when you do it for them, they lose the feeling of ownership of the project. So they are no longer proud of what they did. They do no longer feel like this is what they, did them they made themselves. And they just start losing interest in what you're doing together. Sometimes it's irritating, but still it just takes some patience and we just let them do what they want, and after that we can discuss whether there are other ways to solve the problem. We let them explain to us what they did. According to all the research, the best way to learn is to actually teach something, that's something that you're learning to someone else. So whenever you're looking at students' projects, we are not trying to find 
bugs. You are not trying to uh, make, uh, find better ways to do this project. We, we asked them to explain to us what they did exactly, step by step. And if everything went well, we let them explain to us actually what, what they are going to do next with this project, why they are proud of this project. And this is also a great advice for any parent that is involved in their kids' education. Just let them tell you about what they're doing. And every time we run a class at the last five, 10 minutes, we let the parents come in and see what the projects are and what their kid did during the lesson. We let them fail over and over again because this is what happens in programming in life. And it's difficult for sometimes to let them fail because whenever they fa fail, you feel like you failed because you are not a good enough teacher. That's, that's not the case. You actually, you, a good teacher, when you create a place where it's safe to fail and to move on. We teach them, oh gosh. What do I do? Thank you. We teach them to support each other. So if a kid doesn't know what to do, we actually don't start explaining, but we ask them, okay, let's ask the person next to you, your friend, maybe he or she already has a solution, and maybe he or she can explain it to you. And if they can't explain, then I say, okay, so maybe you two, if you two don't know the answer, maybe it will be easier if you search for that answer together. I know it sounds like, you're try, I'm, as a teacher, not, trying not to do my job and just you know, outsource it to the kids. But this is actually how they learn to, how to search for information and how to support each other. We accept their limitations, which means that we accept the fact that they have exten um, span, span extension, skupienia, attention span, yes. They have their attention span like seven minutes long. And the standard lesson is like, I don't know, 45 minutes, at least in Polish school. So they have seven minutes to focus, and we accept that fact. So every 10 minutes, we change the way we work. We start with group work, then we switch to individual work, then maybe lecture, then maybe some, so, some play or um, physical activity or just presentation. So this is what we do. We show them that we believe in them. And one of the best ways to uh, to show that is to remember all the times they actually succeeded. So next time when they have any trouble and they have any issues, you can tell them that, I know this seems difficult, but I remember last week when you solved this problem. And I think that this time you might also manage to do that. Because they forget about their successes. They forget about the time they did well. They are only focused on the fact that right now they have no idea what to do, and that makes them frustrated. We let them have fun. Actually, the, one of the most popular tools to teach coding, which is Scratch, it's a tool where you have colorful blocks that you join together and they create instructions, and those instructions create games and animations. And this is a lot of fun for kids because they can see the effect immediately. And once I actually met a programmer parent who told me that, okay, this tool is fun, but the problem is this tool doesn't teach the kids the pain and suffering of programming. <laughs> so imagine if we stopped giving crayons to kids just because they might get their hopes high that they will become some kind of artist, so let's just, you know, burn all the crayons. And it's not there up there, but the important also, the factor is also to have fun yourself as a teacher. Because if students see that you are bored and you actually don't want to be where you are, they will feel that, they will know that. You can't hide it from them. So they won't find that motivation in themselves. And I think that the secret why the students keep coming back to us and why they still want to join the classes, even though they say they don't want to become programmers in the future, it is in fact that we are not trying to create the future workforce for IT industry. We're just trying to give them courage to use technology as a creative tool. And the tools we use, Scratch that I already mentioned before. Uh, how many of you have seen this, have tried this? So many of you, that's such a good news. Okay, 
So basically, you can teach even the eight years old how, how to code with, with Scratch, and there are around 40 million users around the world. Another tool, Microbit. How many of you know Microbit? OK, a little bit less. So this is a microcontroller. Uh, you can also code just with the colorful blocks, and you can make your classes much more entertaining and interactive. And there are many resources with actually examples of lessons, curriculums that you can use for Scratch and for, for Microbit too. This one, how many of you know this one? Ha! I knew that. Because this is a Polish robot. <laughs> this is Photon, Photon robot. And of course there are other similar robots like from United States there is Dash and Dot, but I like this one because it's Polish. Uh, and also because um, what they're trying to do with this, okay, so this is a robot that you can program just like you program in Scratch with colorful blocks, but the, right now they're also working on a very cool curriculum to teach kids about basic of AI and machine learning, and that's ambitious, that's something. So you can try it out, and this is actually a tool that is ready to use, you can already buy it, and I recommend it. You can also use it to teach preschoolers. And about the preschoolers, there is this one project I'm very proud of. It's an old project, and I talk about it all the time, but I will keep talking about it, because just this one time in my life I had a crazy idea. Uh, someone, uh, one of my friends told me that I should actually also teach senior citizens how to code, because they also need that. Uh, and I said, like, no, I'm not interested in senior citizens. Maybe I will try preschoolers, because senior citizens are usually taught how to use technology in a very basic way, like how to be safe, how to buy something, how to not become of a victim of something. And I want to use technology in a creative way. And I thought about the preschoolers, uh, because Scratch actually also has an app, which is Scratch Junior, and you can use it for kids who don't know how to read yet. And then I realized that uh, senior citizens spend a lot of time with preschoolers if they are grandparents, for example. They have a lot of free time in general. And there's those small kids, and, and they spend time together. But the kids are so stick to their tablets and their apps, they don't really get to make the connection. So I thought that maybe I could teach grandparents how to teach kids how to code. <laughs> So like completely change the, the, the typical structure. So those who are typically seen as those who don't have digital skills, like the senior citizens, would actually teach younger kids how to code and somehow find a way to, to connect and to create something together. And I actually did that. And there was someone crazy enough to give me money to do that. And we called this project Very Senior Developers. I will show you the video, if I know how to. Is it on? Let me do it the easy way. It's a very old one. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, technology. Sorry, guys. Is there? OK. Uh, It's, it's so difficult. Let me just play it again with some sound. Okay. Can I make that coming? Shit. My button is a shorty money. I'll let you that to go to the house. Do you? Every baby is special, but everything is connected. Są cierpliwe, wytrwałe i przewidujące, czyli mają wiele cech dobrego programisty. Ale nie znam żadnej babci, która by umiała. Ja nie znam. Ja też nie znam. Ja też. Ja Programowanie komputerowe? Yy, tworzenie... Co to jest programowanie komputerowe? Zorganizowaliśmy warsztaty podstaw programowania dla babci. Nie muszą tworzyć drugiego Facebooka. Chcemy, żeby dalej przekazywały dzieciom wiedzę. Ale od teraz, jako nauczycielki programowania, żeby mogły pokazać wnukom, jak być twórcami, a nie tylko konsumentami nowych technologii. 
córka nawet jest w domu, w tej chwili pewnie śpi, albo tam coś sobie, ona nie wie, gdzie ja poszłam. Ja się nawet nie przyznałam, bo przecież to ma co piło normalnie. <grym> Babcie odkryły, że są potrzebne tam, gdzie nie spodziewały się mieć wiele do powiedzenia. Poprowadziły warsztaty, na których dzieci zaprogramowały swoje pierwsze animacje. Rozwijały kreatywność, analityczne i logiczne myślenie. Dzieci przekonały się, że nauka programowania może być jak nauka szycia, pieczenia ciasta czy pisania. Trzeba tylko mieć odwagę zacząć. Jakby ktoś się nauczył programować, to, to ona by mogła później na przykład jakieś zajęcia z tego zrobić i mogłaby później uczyć tego programowania. Żeby mieć jakąś płaszczyznę porozumienia, to właśnie takie programowanie dla dzieci, to uważam, że bardzo dobra rzecz. Thanks guys. There are a couple of lessons that I learned during that project. First, first one is that, okay, I might think that the very senior developer's name is really cool, and you might laugh at it, but this is not actually the way that senior citizens want to be called. They don't want to be called seniors. So it took me two years, but I actually came up with a name that you can use whenever you talk about people who are just taking their first steps and they're just joining the digital world. Uh, no matter the age, is that is digital degrees. So now I call people whom we teach, and they just are doing the um, taking the first steps, digital degrees. And that project also taught me that the the people who you have least like confidence in very often are people that are close to you. Because I had some friends from tech world. And I, I was trying to, you know, recruit some grandmothers. I, I never told them that, I actually didn't tell them that they're going to learn how to code because no one would, you know, sign up. I just told them that uh, we're going to teach them how to use tablets in a creative way. And then they're going to teach kids how to use tablets in a creative way. And I tried to find some grandmothers, grandfathers um, among my friends. And most of those friends were, were from tech world. And they were all asking me questions like, how is my mom doing? Because I, I know that she's, uh, she's probably doing like very bad. She's the worst, right? And all of, <laughs> and you know, all of those who thought that their mother was doing worse, they actually the, were the best. Like, those grandmothers were the best. And not because the, their uh, kids taught them. No, not because of that. They're just very open and active. And I was very lucky to, uh, to find those people. And actually, two of them still keep on teaching and they join our foundation and join our company and they still teach preschoolers how to code. Nowadays, I'm working at the Central Technology Hub. And this is not a place where we develop technology, even though it might sound like a place where technologies are you know, actually developed. What we do is we invest to educate people of all ages and all backgrounds so that they get the skills to become active users and maybe in the future creators of technologies. So it consists of three areas. There is a educational center, conference room, and there is a showroom where we present examples of technology solutions. And in our educational center, we use STEAM method, which basically combines science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. So we try to be as interdisciplinary as you can. And we have some workshops, for example, when we talk to people about how technology can be used to teach others about environmental issues. And just last week, some kids came up with an idea of creating Tinder for bees so that the bees can find proper flowers that they could you know. It might not necessarily make any sense, but you know, this is what we try to do. We actually ask open questions and we don't expect any specific answer. And you can be as creative as you want. And we've been operating for five months now, and these are the stats for last five months. So we actually run 760 workshops and there were 10,000 people who went through those workshops. Except for the workshops, 
in our conference area, we have events with 23 organizations, and we hold events for career advisors, digital skills teachers, for companies who invest in 3D industry, for teenagers who build robots just for fun, and for volunteers who use AR technology to support well-being of cancer patients. So the, the range area of the things that we, um, of the initiatives that we actually host in our places is, is, is very, very wide. It's all possible because of these people the PFR Foundation, which is Polish Development Fund Foundation, because our classes are very affordable or free, and it's all possible because we actually have backup from many companies and many organizations. And how you can help? First of all, support local projects. And the easiest and fastest way to find a local project, educational project, digital skills educational project, is to go to the website of this very cool European initiative. How many of you know Code Week? Okay, so, yes. so this, is just one, this is one week in October usually, where there are so many events, like they, last year they had over four million participants from 80 countries, so you just go to their events page, you find events in your country, and you see who organized that, and those are organizations that you can support. You can support them by, of course, donating, but you can also give them a shout out on your social media, or you can encourage your employee to actually, for example, let the employ uh, employers choose, a, choose one of the organizations and donate each year for this event. You can share your knowledge, which means that you can volunteer in different kind of projects when you can teach how to code. I'm always uh, not sure if I should tell that to programmers to actually start volunteering because what I found about um, teaching and, uh, and programmers is that it's much easier to find a teacher and teach him how, how to code than find a programmer and teach him how to teach. <laughs> but still, I have some hope in you. There's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason why you are here. So, so share your knowledge, and if you don't know how to teach, maybe you can create some resources that can be later used by different kind of organizations. And the easiest way, this is the easiest thing that you can do is to talk to your family and friends about what you do. Why is it so important? Most of parents outside from, who are outside from the tech industry, who, who actually bring their kids to our classes, are parents who learned from their family members or friends why technology is important and that they can actually start to teach their kids at a very young age. It's also very important because even if you know someone from tech world, for example, I have a best friend who now works at Microsoft as a senior something, cloud architect, yes, senior cloud architect. So she works at Microsoft and I have this cousin who is a teenager in high school, and I told this teenager that, you know what, I have a friend at Microsoft, and she actually went to the same high school you are now attending. And she was so surprised, even though she knew what I do in my life, that I actually teach kids and teenagers how to code. She was so surprised, she asked me if my friend has parents at Microsoft, because she couldn't believe that you could get a job there, coming from that high school in the very small town, and actually reach that uh, uh, reach that point of your career. So you might be afraid to talk to kids, and I, I understand that, because actually the last time a kid asked me how old I am and I answered, she said that I should be dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand that you're afraid of kids. So you might not be able to get into deep conversations with them, but just the fact that they know what you do, they understand that maybe in the future, you are the one that you can ask for advice, and if you talk to their parents, this might be enough to open new future paths for them. How much time do I have? Okay, why do it? <laughs> so, my mom, um, she asked me like every year, when am I going to make like a real career? <laughs> she's an Asian mom, you know, this is like her duty. So she's a typical Asian mom and she, she you know, she 
she accepted the fact that I'm not going to be a doctor. She accepted the fact that I'm not going to be a lawyer. So nowadays she asked me when I'm going to become a proper programmer because I'm not a proper programmer. I just learned the basics enough so that I can teach kids. Uh, and I, I understand her because she's afraid, she's worried about my future. And I get that because I actually took it to the next level. I'm worried about the future, but I'm actually worried about the future of the whole humankind in general. Because I read all those researchers, predictions, and trend books about future. And basically what they say about the future, except for the fact that it's going to change a lot, that it's difficult to predict, and so on and so on, what they say, and now I'm going to translate from corporate language, even the corporate researchers say, in very simple sentences, our planet is dying. We are running out of resources. Everyone is getting old and sick. The jobs are being taken, and the people will get mad. There are actually researchers telling us that we need to think if we should actually renegotiate the whole social contract because it is so based on work and the, and the reality of work and jobs is changing so much that we actually have to renegotiate the very basics. Even the corporate researchers say that, you, you know what, we actually need to start thinking about how to protect employees' rights, workers' rights. And they all say that the easiest way to predict the future is actually if you participate in creating it. And they all say that everyone needs to get involved and take responsibility in building future. This sounds very big. And I have two motherlands. One of them is Poland. This is my chosen motherland. This is where my chosen family is. And if you look at the Digital Economy and Society Index ranking, Poland is very far behind. We are not really ready to embrace technology. And my second motherland, where my family is, is Vietnam, where only like 20% of students actually get advice on how to safely use internet from their parents. Believe me, Vietnamese don't know how to safely use the internet. You can't believe how many like birth certificates I saw on my news, uh, Facebook new, uh, news feed. Like so many. I could be a great scammer. So when I look at those stats and I think about my fellow humans in Poland in, and in Vietnam, about their digital skills and about at what point of development they are right now, I'm wondering like how come people, how can people who don't have understanding of technology, who don't know how to use technology safely, how can they feel empowered to participate in making decisions about the future? They're not going to be the ones involved in creating the reality that is so shaped by technology if they don't understand what's going on with technology, if they don't understand that the algorithm that is used to recruit people might be biased if they don't understand that the voting systems can be hacked, if they don't understand that technology is not something that is all-knowing and touchable, and it can make, this, make mistakes. So I'm worried about those people and my future in general. Uh, and that's why I, I try to speak at these events where I can meet you tech people. And the reason I do this because Remember when I told you that I spent a month and I learned that you're actually regular humans? I was wrong. You are not regular humans. You are one of the most privileged people on this planet. And let me ask you a question, and please raise your hand if you feel like you're conscious about your online safety and privacy. Raise a hand if at some point in your life, you, you looked at a non-technical problem, and you thought that, oh, there could be a tech solution for that. There could be an app for that. How many of you? Thank you. And the last question, how many of you looked at the technical problem, sorry, technical solution, and you thought that this could be actually done better? <laughs> <laughs> See. You, you are the people uh, that companies fight over. They you know, try to seduce you with beanbags, with slides, with outrageous benefits, salaries, and so on. You know, Asian mothers tell their kids to become you. This means something. So, but actually, the money and status is not what makes you so privileged. What makes you so privileged is that at some point in your life, 
You wrote the code, you run it, there are no bugs. And at that moment, you became someone who decides how something works. And most people on this planet, they don't have that feeling. They never had that feeling. They were never empowered. They were never made to understand what possibilities, limitations, hopes, and risks technology brings. They cannot participate in future building that is based on technology because they don't have the skills, understanding, and knowledge. So that's why I need you to be my allies and all my colleagues' allies. I need you to be the ones who go out and talk to your people, to your friends, to invest in, in projects that are actually helping people to get the digital skills because you are the ones who can do that. I need you to go out and explain to people that technology is magic that can be learned and that behind actually very, every technology there are people and those people outside the industry can be among them. This is what will make my fear of future, my, the way I look at the future, just a little bit more hopeful, hopeful, and a little bit more hopeful for all those people, not only in Poland, but in Vietnam, but all those countries where right now the teen teenagers don't even believe that they can be smarter than they are now. So this is what I'm asking you today. And I wanted to in introduce someone who actually makes me feel and think more hopefully about the future. This is Alexandra Bernatovich. Please welcome. Hello. And now we just. Hi, my name is Ola Bernatovich, and I'm here to tell you about my journey with programming. I'm 11 years old. In my free time, I like to read fantasy, adventure, and comic books. I like drawing manga and kawaii. I like uh, water sports, sailing, surfing, and wakeboarding. I also play squash. I started to learn programming when I was 8 years old. My parents signed me up for Scratch classes at Kids Got Fun. I did three levels of this course. The most exciting thing for me about Scratch was possibility to create a game by myself. I came up with the ideas how it's going to look like, what would be the rules of the game, and then I could do it by myself. We always posted our projects on our class group webpage. Thanks to that, we could see what our colleagues are doing, put likes behind the games, play our classmates' games, and then get some inspirations for our new projects by watching what others are doing. When I started programming, my games were really easy and simple. At the end of my Scratch course, I made Super Mario as a birthday gift for my dad. Now, I have Scratch at school as well. Just a couple of lessons, but still I can practice what I have learned on my Scratch course. Sometimes I'm still logging into my Scratch profile to see my first projects. This was my first project and it was really easy and simple. And those three are my Laster's projects and I made them at the end of my Scratch course. And as you can see, uh, the last one is, my, is a, a birthday gift from my dad. After Scratch, I attended Code Combat course. That was super exciting as with the help of our instructors, we could write a code which allowed me to go to the next level of the game. We had kind of competition there. Instructors gave us level to achieve and everybody wanted to complete this before the end of the class. Third year with programming, I spent on learning JavaScript. After that course, I have learned that code that that there is a code written behind each web page and how important it is to put it properly to achieve expected results. I have learned that coding is like re learning foreign language. The more you read and write, the better you become. I created my first game in JavaScript, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Why I like programming? I have tried different programming languages and what I like the most about programming is that it gives me opportunity to create games by myself. I decide what I want to create, how it's going to look like, what would be the rules of the game, colors, background, and who would be the hero. I don't need books. 
Programming is accessible via a web page on my computer. I can practice whenever I want. I just need my computer. It's cool, because when I th do things properly, I see the results straight and forward, and it motivates me to work further. What's next? I was on holidays in Japan, and I had possibility to visit Manga Museum in Kyoto. After that time, I completely fell in love with manga and kawaii drawings. I practice hand drawing now, but I have learned that I can combine this with gra graphic curves where I would be able to learn how to design characters on computer. Two years ago, my yes keeper told me, learn programming or someone will program you. I definitely prefer the first one. I want to learn programming. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Alexander, so much. So uh, we still have a couple of minutes. So if you have, uh, do we have like a Q&A or not? Yeah, we, do, we can do Q&A, we will, we want to. I just, I didn't know that uh, yeah. Alexander was going to finish for us. Um, we can finish, or we can have uh, Q&A. Do you have any questions? I don't see any questions. Oh, there's one question. <laughs> or do you want to finish? I'm so confused now. So how early can you start programming? How At early? How early? Well, there are some tools that claim to be suitable for four years old, but I suggest that you just let it go, maybe just wait until the kids are eight years old, because then they can probably read, and this is a very good uh, moment to start. So I would recommend eight years old. But six is still okay. <laughs> I have a question. When kids start programming with Scratch, what is the good next step when they uh, are already quite proficient with programming in Scratch? Uh, what is a good next move to do? Uh, in our experience, if they're about 12 or 13 years old and they already know Scratch, the good next step is, for example, JavaScript. JavaScript or Python, any language that is easy enough and you can see results quickly, but not C++, please. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would be surprised how many parents like, oh, I don't want to say it, you know. Uh, hi. Uh, you showed really great numbers of people that attended the course. Do you track their later journey through coding and programming and how many of them actually continue there? You're talking about the stats about the Central Technology Hub, right? So there are yeah. great numbers. Well, the, the idea of, the, of our first years of, year of operation is actually just to introduce people to the idea that they can join uh, a class that is somehow connected with technology and, and, and doesn't need to be scary. So actually, our idea is not to make people like, involved in coding, but just to start feeling comfortable with technology used in a creative way. So we don't track them right now because we'll be, we've been doing so many workshops, we didn't have time to create a proper evaluation tool, but we're doing it right now. Uh, so in the beginning you showed uh, the percentage of how many kids have access to internet in school. Yes. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was a good or a bad thing because I know some teachers would probably be more happy if they didn't. So do you also teach proper uh, usage of internet? not during class on their mobile phones when they should be learning English? Uh, this is a great question in, in digital education. Like some people say that you should ban smartphones and ba ban internet connection. But you know, uh, the kids have so many other opportunities outside the school to, to use it anyway. And if you're banning it at school, it's, it, uh, well, I, actually I'd rather use smartphones as another tool to to teach them how to use it properly, just like you say, like teach them how to use it safely. Uh, is it bad that schools don't have internet connection? Well, if you say that technology is going to save the education because everyone can have access and use the, the education online, and most of the time that we spend on education happens at school, so if you don't have internet access at school, then you don't have access to that education. 
So I'd rather have internet in general. Uh, so, so you say that the, um, the, the best time to start teaching your children programming is like eight or six years old. Um, can you do anything before to kind of prepare the children to learn programming, to like, you know, yes. start teaching them some kind of core concepts of logic or anything like that? Or do you just wait until they are six or eight years old and then you just, you know, go for scratch or something? Uh, usually my advice for parents who want to start teaching kids before they are eight years old is to start learn yourself how to be a good teacher. This is what you can do when they're younger. So start with yourself and just let kids be kids. But if you actually want to use some tools, yes, there's, for example, Scratch Junior that can be used even when you're five years old. Uh, there is this Scotty Go game. Scotty Go game is a, uh, is a puzzle game uh, and there are some versions of it for younger kids. But in general, teach them basic logic with some logic games if you really need to start so early. But I just recommend to let kids be kids until they're eight years old and then, then start that education. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, so you've done this in Poland and you said that you also have another home in Vietnam. How do you see, or do you see yourself taking this back to Vietnam? And if so, like, how would you adapt it? Because I guess, like, it's a very different mm, culture uh, and situation. Well, this is also a, a personal question, because it's, uh, it's about whether I want to go back to Vietnam. No, but <laughs> I guess, like, uh, what I'm coming to is, like, yeah. would you try to move this to a developing country, and how yes. would you do that? Yes, I, I would probably try, and I think that it, in some ways, it would be easier because in Asian countries, parents invest much more in education and are more aware of the facts that it is important. On the other hand, the Asian parents, or from what I know, because I also uh, spent a year in Indonesia creating programs in programming schools for kids, uh, what I notice in Asian parents is that they want to have like results on paper, certificates, very proper like achievements. So it's not really about creativity and developing also soft skills. So it, might, it can be frustrating because if you don't have like a proper certification to give, then they're not interested. They're not really interested. So there are different challenges. I would still try, uh, but probably in Vietnam, I, I would start with safety internet use, uh, usage courses, to be honest. Uh, can I ask a question to Alexandra? Yes. Hola. Uh, Do you have time? Because I know you have to go back. Okay. My, my question is, is, is me. My question is whether uh, uh, whether you have other friends your age who you who. It's here. Voilà. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, is is your case unusual, or do you have lots of friends that also are programmers? Are they jealous of your? Uh, uh, computer yes. savvy? Yes, uh, I have uh, uh, some friends uh, that learn, uh, they're, they're learning coding too. How many? I don't know, but <laughs> a, a little bit, but not so much. Okay. Are we? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.